Hello, everyone. This is Heikki Kovalainen, and uh, you're listening to Beyond the Grid podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome once again to your favorite corner of podcast land, Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Here's hoping that you're all fit and well and ready to hear from another cracking guest, because this week... I'm chatting to a man who was hugely popular back in the day for his relaxed, easygoing persona, Heiki Kovalainen. And he was no slouch either. Heiki won the 2008 Hungarian Grand Prix. But that was to be his only win in a career that spanned 111 races for Renault, McLaren, Caterham and Lotus. His talent probably deserved to win more races, but for various reasons, which we look into in this extremely fascinating and candid chat, that didn't happen. It wasn't the machinery at his disposal, at least when he was at McLaren, because his teammate Lewis Hamilton won the world championship in the same MP423. The thing is, except for that win in Hungary, which Heike inherited after Felipe Massa retired late in the race, he rarely got the rub of the green. Yes, in this business you often make your own luck, but if there was bad luck to be had, Heike was usually on the receiving end. And throughout his Formula One career, there were management issues and all sorts of other drains on his energy and focus. Yet Heike makes no excuses. His sense of perspective is remarkable, and he remains one of the most articulate and unassuming drivers ever to sit in a Formula One car. And don't forget that he was bloody quick on his day. His pole lap at Silverstone in 2008 was one of the great laps of that season, and a reminder to Lewis Hamilton and the like of his fabulous speed. These days, Heike races GTs in Japan, but he lives in Finland and sunny Abu Dhabi. We caught up remotely and he regaled me with fascinating tales about what it was like to be teammates with arguably the best driver of all time. That massive Spanish Grand Prix crash he had in 2008, why his Formula One career took the twists and turns that it did, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Heiki, it's great to see you via Zoom. You're looking very well. Where in the world are you at the minute? Well, in fact, now uh, I've spent the last few weeks here in North Finland. Uh, we've got a small cottage in the middle of the forest here. And uh, I was, in fact, preparing for my Super GT season in Japan already. Uh, things were still going ahead there. But then eventually the start of the season got postponed. And the only, uh, in fact, the only place that I could return, or maybe not the only place, but in one of my my homes is in Finland and this was the only home at the time that I could return because uh, our normal residence, which is in Abu Dhabi, uh, was already in lockdown, so I couldn't return there. So I got back here and uh, in fact, it's not too bad place to be. It's very quiet here. It's uh, very easy to uh, distance myself from everyone and uh, I can still do some activities outside and, and relatively normal cottage life. So it's uh, not too bad place to be during this time. Sounds amazing. Now, before we go on, you've got a picture on the wall behind you. Yeah. It looks like a mid seventies McLaren. I'm guessing an M23. Yeah, it's possible. It's uh, James Hunt seventy six. So perhaps that was the McLaren at that time. Yeah, it's uh, yeah the one he won the championship. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's a friend of mine who's making these sprints uh, and, and this kind of artwork. Um, and uh, he asked me a while ago to uh, pick one as a as a souvenir from him to to me and uh, i picked this one not because of james hunt I'm, I'm, although i'm a fan of hunt I, i'm not that big fan but uh, in fact uh, the mount fuji on the background in that uh, uh, artwork is the reason why i picked that uh, fuji is a special place for me in japan uh, first time i ever went to japan as a test driver for the renault team in 2006 was um, we went to Fuji and we had a nice event there with uh, with some of the sponsors. Uh, my first podium in Formula One, 2007, happened at Fuji, and also my first first podium in Super GT in 2016 was at Fuji. So that's the reason why I picked that picture. It's not a very nice artwork, yeah. This is lovely. Well, let's talk about your Formula One career now in more detail. And I want to start, if I may, by taking you back to Silverstone 2008. You're in your first year with McLaren alongside Lewis Hamilton. And I think I witnessed one of the best qualifying laps I've ever seen. You put the car on pole by half a second. I think Weber was alongside you on the grid. Hamilton was back in fourth. Was that the best lap of your Formula One career? Well, it's hard to say whether it was 
the best lap, but it was uh, a good one. I think one of the good ones that weekend. In fact, all weekend uh, was looking quite strong for me. Uh, the practice sessions on Friday, uh, I was right near the top, if if not on top on both sessions on Friday. The car felt good. Uh, the tires felt good. Everything felt fine. And and uh, the qualifying day, I remember it was a really windy day. And then some of the corners, uh, there a lot of guys were struggling, uh, in fact, to put a good lap together. And, and I think also Lewis... Uh, on his best lap, he was uh, caught by a gust of wind in one of the corners. It was towards the end of the lap. I can't remember exactly, exactly which corner, but I think he lost more time. And, and the gap to Lewis was bigger than it perhaps should have been. But uh, you know, having said that, I think I had legs that weekend uh, for Lewis. Uh, I, I was looking strong that weekend. So it was a good lap. And of course, a good opportunity for me uh, to take my first pole. And shame it was the only one, but uh, at least some good memories, yeah. Pedro de la Rosa, who was the test driver that year with you guys, yeah. says it was one of the best laps he's ever seen. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, I remember the engineers, my race engineer, Mark Slade, and, and the whole McLaren team, obviously, they they were very happy about that. And, and Mark was uh, telling me, you know, it was really good lap. And, you know, he was obviously very pleased, uh, pleased for that. Uh, it didn't feel uh, that special. That just that weekend, uh, uh, every session felt relatively comfortable for me. And I... Even that qualifying, I remember um, after I'd done the lap, I, uh, you know, it didn't feel like super lap inside the car. It felt tidy and, and good lap, but didn't feel uh, like super lap. Like sometimes you feel like, wow, that that felt really good. Uh, but the time was really good, and I think I managed the conditions that day better than anyone there on the grid. Can you talk to me about how you used to prepare yourself for a qualifying lap? And the sort of the pressure and how different your approach was to qualifying compared to the race. Um, yeah, I guess it was um, um, somewhat different. I, I used to do quite a lot of um, uh, like, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it in English, but like uh, mentally preparing. I was going through the lap in my my head. I, I, Vis- visualization. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, visualization. I've done that uh, in fact, all the way through my career, uh, I did that before I got into the garage in my in my little room while I was sitting in the car and I was kind of going through the lap. And, and I've, I've done that quite a lot. Um, for the race, it's slightly different. It's, it's very hard to prepare for the race. Uh, the, the race start always um, is so unpredictable and so uh, um, difficult to plan that it's almost better not to plan it. And it's just let your instinct and go with your... Um, you know your instinct and let your uh, body make the choices and the subconscious mind make the choices for you in the race but in the qualifying i think the preparation for me at least uh, was useful and i still do that in the gt races as well so i remember before the qualifier after the third practice session uh, sitting in my room going through the lap and, and and through the breaking points and and kind of like you know trying to picture uh, picture that uh, that lap in my head and uh, I think the qualifying, in fact, has never been such a big problem. I've always been relatively good qualifier. So maybe it's something that's worked <laughs> reasonably well over my career. So, Heike, in the race at Silverstone, you start on pole. Cut a long story short, you finish fifth and your teammate drives one of the, the races of his career and wins the race wet, et cetera, et cetera. In, in a funny kind of way, does that weekend slightly sum up your two years at McLaren in that it sort of promised so much and yet ultimately turned out to be a little bit frustrating? Is that how you view those two years? Yeah, I think it's quite well said. Um, and it's, it's, it's the truth, really. Actually, the f- first year at McLaren started really well uh, in Melbourne. I qualified third. And uh, in fact, in the race, in my first race with McLaren, Without the safety car, I think my strategy at that point uh, would have been very good. I was, I had a chance to jump Lewis or at least uh, jump, I think it was Robert in front of me, and probably finish um, second or third in that race, if not win the first race. And then after the first few races, I think I was ahead of Lewis in the points. But uh, then, uh, you know, things didn't eventually then work out as, as planned. So, yeah, I think you're right. It kind of sums up that there was some promise and I... I had some momentum going to McLaren. My first year, Renault started really poor, but I managed to turn the season around. And and at the end of the 2007 season, uh, things were starting to click and started to work. And I started to make some decent results. And, and I was ahead of Fizzy most of the time. So I had the momentum. The momentum continued at the beginning of 2008 season, but I didn't manage to ride the wave all the way, if you like. And 
then second half of 2009 season, it fell apart. That's probably a good way to describe it. I think there are many reasons for it. Uh, yeah, ultimately, it just didn't work out. What about Lewis Hamilton? I mean, I would put a pretty strong argument to you that had you had any other teammate in 2008, I think the might have been different. D- just tell us about the relationship with Lewis, particularly in that first season. And, and, I, and also, let's celebrate Lewis. I mean, what makes him such a, a phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, uh, I had a great two years with Lewis as a teammate. Uh, we've never had uh, uh, any big problems with us. And perhaps one reason that we've always gotten on very well is I, I'd never really challenged him like seriously enough, perhaps. Uh, he'd never got enough of a challenge that you know he needed to stretch. But uh, in fact, uh, I felt the both years there, it was hard for me. He was just that tiny bit faster all the time. And I had to stretch every session. <laughs> It was um, straight from the winter test. You know, I was always like, I had to stretch to match him or be ahead of him. Like an average lap wasn't good enough. And uh, when you've done that for a year and a half, I kind of run out of energy. (laughs) And uh, the second half of the second year in 2009 in McLaren, it's fair to say that I, I drove below my own ability even. Rather than focusing on my own race and my own results and 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 trying to get close to Lewis, you know, I started to overdrive and, and getting frustrated. And in fact, the gap just got bigger and, and I made some mistakes. And But I think the reason why that happened during that second half of 2009 was because I, I had to stretch all the time. And when you're stretching for, for too long time, you run into a wall at some point. And, and I think that's what happened. Uh, I think it's just his pace was just a tiny bit quicker consistently. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't have any trouble admitting it you know he's one of the greatest if not the greatest driver so i'm glad i went against him but at that point of my career it was also quite detrimental for my career Uh, i had a bit of momentum but i wasn't able to uh, keep the momentum going uh, with lewis as my teammate is lewis the kind of guy who has to be fastest in every session yeah i think he is and i think that's one of the reasons (laughs) why he is so great Um, he's got unbelievable fighting spirit in, in himself um you know we had some um you know some funny things sometimes we did and i mean he, he took even like a small bets very seriously for example at spa i think in 2009 we were at spa and the first practice was just about to start and i think lewis came to me and said that uh, would you like to do a bet uh, just on the outlap that uh, who goes faster through a, a rouge straight out of the box uh, and because those days it wasn't not wasn't like easy flat out uh, straight out of the box on Friday morning <laughs> and I said yeah yeah we'll do that and I mean he just went with the right leg straight and he went flat out the first lap and I had a tiny lift and I lost the bet <laughs> but uh, that, that was kind of thing that he I, I kind of knew that that's the lost money for me I was never going to win that so yeah he's he's got unbelievable fighting spirit that is fantastic did you have lots of bets is he quite like that or was it just that one occasion uh, not 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 a lot of bets but I remember that that one, that particular one, uh, we we did, and the engineers found out that afterwards, and they were like, my engineer was like, what, what, what are you doing? You know, it's not <laughs> like not risking everything. You know, Friday morning, and and uh, I mean, I was lifting, and he wasn't, so I was like, he's risking it, risking it more. <laughs> hey, he, where is he particularly impressive? Is it under braking or? Seems to be there's obviously so much time to be made up there, but also is it through fast stuff? Is there one particular area? Yeah, I think the main area that I struggled uh, to match him was breaking areas. So he was able to break later and harder, and yet he was able to hit the apex and and make the exit the same as mine. Generally, his lines were a bit more square than mine, so he braked late and deep, turned the car in quite a short distance. And then his exits were quite straight. And I think that's one of the reasons over the years that he's been able to look after tires also very well. He puts less energy into the tires. And when he puts the energy, he puts them in, in places that it hurts the tires less. Like I was loading the tires. I was making corners quite long. And that's kind of my driving style. And, and I remember at McLaren, the engineers were also saying the Fernando style a bit similar. Kimi style and Mika style, they all carry a lot of speed into the corner and they make corners very long whereas Lewis he arrives brakes late turns the car sharp and has a straighter exit so the, the tire has less energy and I remember that particular area the braking areas were always 
where I was struggling against him. So I think that's uh, one of the key areas where he's very good. I remember in the high speed stuff, I was able to match him like minimum speeds in the high speed corners. That wasn't that hard. It was uh, easier to match him. But the braking areas and, and low speed corners, he's very good at driving when the car doesn't have the maximum aero load and the car is moving around a bit more and, and you kind of sitting on the mechanical grip and on the on the tire grip, if you like. He's he's very good at he's got some special sensors in his in his ass <laughs> that he can just just uh, tiptoe on that edge just a bit beyond everyone else, I think. Are you friendly with Valtteri, just out of interest? Yeah, I am friendly with Valtteri, yeah. Were you able to give him any pointers when he when he joined Mercedes? Um, no, I mean, not really. I mean, he's never asked me anything. Of course, if he ever asked, uh, I could talk to him. Uh, but only a few times I've spoken to him after some Grand Prix uh, during his first year, I think he was at Mercedes. Um, uh, he had a few races where he was struggling with tyre wear more than Lewis, and especially rear tyres, he was unable to keep the soft tyre alive as as well as Lewis, and I remember we talked, I think it was after Bahrain, maybe his first year at Mercedes, and after Bahrain, we talked about that, and I I was telling him my experience about Lewis. I said, you know, just pay attention, you know, he's braking, and he's kind of low speed, uh, low speed style, if you if you like, uh, keep an eye on that, because that's where he's really strong, and and I think Valtteri agreed with that, but I haven't, you know, I haven't given him any tips, I think, um, he can figure it out himself and he, he's done very well over the years I thought but yeah we've had small chats every now and then Spain 2008 you've just taken the lead of the race and then you have a front left wheel rim failure at what 150 miles an hour I guess turn 9 at Barcelona huge accident yeah Ho- horrible to watch uh, I think you were buried under the tyre barrier weren't you yeah First of all, let's talk about the crash, actually. How much warning did you get of that rim failure? And, and can you remember what you thought as you were <laughs> heading towards the barrier? Yeah, in fact, uh, I can't remember uh, the whole incident. I remember starting the the lap. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, maybe Robert was in front of me and he pitted. And I think I had, out of the guys at the top, I had the most fuel. So I had a couple of laps extra on everyone. And uh I remember engineer telling me, uh, "Okay, now it's time to time to push and turn up the engine a bit and and trying to make a bit of time before I will stop." Then I have a four-hour blackout, getting back to this world uh, at hospital with Ron there, and, and uh, I think Marty was there and my wife was there, and I, I don't remember anything about that. But yeah, it, I, I think there was no warning. Just looking back, uh, looking at some of the footage, and you know, there was no warning. The the wheel nut was just coming off during that first stint. Uh, there was some lacquer coating been left between the wheel and the uh, and the nut and uh, and the nut wasn't fully tightened at the start of the race and uh, it came off just a couple of laps too early i mean had i stopped lap or two earlier uh, would have probably not happened but uh, yeah it happened in the worst place obviously it always happens in the higher speed corner and and there was no no way to escape that so it was a big hit and i hit my head under the well, car sort of slid under the barrier and i hit my head into the barrier and that would knock me out but uh, I mean, there was no other other damage, just a hit in the head and a bit of a concussion. Interesting that you say Ron Dennis was there when you came round. Yeah, yeah, he was there and obviously everyone was worried. Uh, worried, uh, you know, it kind of looked when I went under the barrier and my head got a hit. I think uh, you never know if the whole head is being chopped off. You know, it's, it looked quite bad. Fortunately, um, you know, nothing more than that happened. Uh, just a hit in my head and... Yeah, I stayed in Spain for a week, uh, just as precautionary uh, checks. And uh, and uh, then, yeah, I went back home. And then I think it was a couple of weeks later, we were in Istanbul. So. Do you think in hindsight you were ready to race in the Turkish Grand Prix? Uh, I think I was ready. I think I was ready, yeah. Uh, I had some headaches, uh, but uh, all the other sort of neurological tests that I did uh, with, uh, with the doctors, they were all normal so i think i was ready and and in fact i i qualified very well there in fact my engineer told me again there that we need to hit you in the head more often because it seems like the performance been really good <laughs> <laughs> i think I, I qualified on the front row with the two-stop strategy most of the guys won a three-stop strategy so you were really looking strong uh for the race and then uh just uh, kimi touched me in the first corner i got a puncture and the race fell apart but uh I think uh, physically and mentally, I was ready to race. Yeah, there was no no issues with that. What about the dangers, just out of interest, particularly in Formula One? How did you come to terms with the dangers of the sport? And of course, 
you know, we'll, we'll come and talk about your win in Hungary, but of course, Felipe Massa as well and his accident. Do you think about that much? No. Even after the, the crash in Spain, did it make you question things more? Or No, it didn't. Um, Mad racing driver. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, <laughs> many people ask about this and I mean, I've never thought about it and never worried about it once I get into the race car at, at least up to this point of my career I'm still committed and still not even thinking about the dangers and risks um, I think when the day comes that I start thinking about it it's time to stop I think uh, you can't afford to be afraid of it and worrying about it too much um, or in fact worrying about it at all I think it's not possible to race hard and, and race well and, and being worried about it but maybe that day will arrive one day and uh, I'm getting older. I'm getting <laughs> to the end of my career, towards the end of my career, I'm, I'm sure. If I, the, the end is closer than the beginning, I'm, I'm sure. So uh, Nah, you're only 38, Heike. You're only 38. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, yeah, I mean, who, yeah, who knows? I mean, maybe, maybe you can still race a few years, but uh, I've been racing since, I think, since uh, very many years ago. So I, I'm, I'm sure that um, at some point, the, the end will come but um, so far at least I haven't uh, haven't been worried I haven't worried about these kind of things and and I've never never thought about it people ask about it and I just say I've never never even considered never even thought about that so I'm interested you say that you did some neurological tests after Barcelona I'm quite interested to know what they were how much can you tell us about that yeah we did uh, I think the sort of basic basic uh, kind of tests uh, some memory tests some uh some coordination tests and uh, there was many, they, I think there are many different protocols that you can do and I had to do, a lot of, oh, I, we did, uh, I don't think I had to do, but uh, the doctor McLaren at that time uh, uh, wanted me to do all these things and just to check. So, I mean, they scanned all the brains, uh, all the CT scans and everything were fine. Uh, still, they wanted to, to check that all the neurological and sort of your neurological skills have stayed the same. And then before the Istanbul, I also had to do the official FI test, which is kind of similar, similar things. There's some memory things and some kind of puzzles that you have to have to pass. Um, and the doctor, uh, Gary Hartstein, he said, uh, you're good to go. So uh, they were all fine. And I'm guessing Gary and the McLaren doctor, was it Aki Hintze? Yeah, yeah. I imagine they'd already spoken as well. Yeah, they'd already spoken and, and Aki was confident uh, he he said to me that from what he's seen, he's happy for me to race if I feel like racing. And yeah, of course, I felt like racing. I I, I felt fine. Just a little bit of headaches. Still, before the Istanbul weekend, I had some small headaches, but uh, they said it was normal after that kind of big impact. It was quite a big concussion, quite a long kind of blackout. So it takes a while, but uh, all the other signs were good. So there was no danger. There was nothing to worry about uh, otherwise. Aki very sadly passed away a couple of years ago, didn't he? But yeah. how how much of an influence did he have on you and your career? Yeah, he had a lot. Uh, he was a good friend of mine and all, all of his family were a good friend of mine and still, still are. He was um, kind of somehow like a visionary and he, he was um, one of the first ones to put together like a really uh, complete uh, programs for race drivers and, and I think... Uh, I mean, Schumacher started, and maybe Senna and Schumacher, they've started that sort of fitness side. But then I think Aki has brought a lot of other aspects in terms of driver training and driver preparation into the Formula One world. And um, a lot of the stuff that we did, I think, were ahead of time nowadays. Perhaps all the teams are doing similar things, and it's kind of normal uh, how the younger drivers, especially, are preparing for their careers. But uh, Aki was a bit ahead of his time, I would say. And uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, interesting stuff. Some stuff were got complicated, but uh, I think we got some benefits and, and Lewis was in that program and many other drivers obviously were in that program. I think they've all gotten benefit benefit of that. The one time I came across Aki was about 10 years ago. Must God, was it? maybe it was longer than that, but we ran the Nürburgring, Nürburgring Nordschleife together. Ah, okay. All 14 miles of it. And Aki must have been... I don't know how old he was, but a lot older than me. And I thought, oh, I've got Aki here. I've got him. I've got yeah. him. There's no... <laughs> anyway, that man had an engine on him and real grit and determination. And um, he was just like a, a train that wouldn't stop. Anyway, 14 miles later, he looked as fresh as a daisy and I was in bits. But there you go. That's my, my memory of him. I just thought, what a solid, determined guy he must have been. And it, I can see why you racing drivers found him such an inspiration, actually. Yeah, yeah. He was a special kind of guy and, and uh, he was... He was very good at uh, 
digging the performance out of drivers and he's, he's he was like more than uh, just a trainer or a physio or a doctor or a, or a mentor or, or psychologist he was kind of like uh, it's, it's hard to find the correct word but like he was really good at steering the driver sometimes calming things down a bit if you're getting a bit overexcited or something and then sometimes pulling the right ropes to just pull you out of a hole and um, he was really good at that I think uh, a lot of uh, his work with a lot of different athletes not just the Formula One drivers but he's worked with a lot of Olympians and you know other athletes from other sports and uh, he's seen a lot I think he's uh, figured a lot of things that different people are doing and he was able to like put together a very um, very comprehensive very complete program from all kind of aspects from different sports and and uh, and taking the good good things from different sports and put them together and that was I think one of his sort of special skills that he had. Was he a good manager as well because how did he deal with the intra-team rivalry between you and Lewis? You were both close to him without the sort of politics of the situation influencing the situation. Yeah I think he was and uh, um Perhaps mine and Lewis's um, relationship was not that complicated. I think we were always very straightforward. And and like I said earlier, perhaps uh, the reason that he was always just a step ahead, uh, he never felt like taking all his tools out of his box to <laughs> to fight. He's done that with a few other drivers, uh, most notably with uh, Rosberg. I think uh, he had to dig deeper and he took more tools out of his box. And uh, perhaps at that point, it would have been more difficult to to manage the situation. But uh, anyway, Aki was very good uh, in, inside the team to get the engineers and the drivers, the team management to work together, telling them and, and guiding them how to focus on the right things, not things that are not, uh, not so important. There's always a lot of problems in many aspects of, of racing. He was able to guide everyone in the team in the correct direction and in the direction matters, the things that matters, and I think that was uh, where he was very good at. Now let's talk about your day of days, that victory in Hungary 2008. Into his final few corners then for Heike Kovalainen. This extraordinary Hungara ring circuit delivers up its seventh different winner in seven years. Heike Kovalainen wins the Hungarian Grand Prix, his first ever Grand Prix victory. I'm sure there'll be plenty more, but what an extraordinary Grand Prix. Can you just describe what it was like to win the race and... Why did it feel, or if it did, why did it feel different to winning a race in any other category? Yeah, I mean, it was, first of all, a race that I probably um, shouldn't have won. Um, I think uh, probably a podium, a third, would have been the result that my performance that day deserved. Uh, I think Massa was going to win the race, uh, Louis was going to finish second, and I was going to finish third. It looked like that. But all, I remember all weekend, Louis had more front tire wear. He was he was harder on his front tire for some reason that that weekend, and in fact he was on a different strategy. He was on a three stop strategy, and I was on a two stop strategy. And uh, and he still uh, wore his left front tire out, and uh, and his left front tire exploded for a few laps from the end or whatever it was. And then Massa just seemed strong that weekend, and uh, I think I had no legs performance on him. But uh, three laps from the end, when I entered the main straight, I saw. A car on the right side with the smoke coming from the engine. At first, I I thought it was a Toro Rosso. I think I was about to lap a Toro Rosso or something. And then when I went past the car, I I saw wow, that was a that looked like a Ferrari and it must be Massa. And then my engineer came to me and said, "Okay, three laps to go. We are leading the race. So <laughs> steady hands now." <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but I had plenty of margin behind me. I think there was Timo Glock behind me. I don't know eight or ten seconds or something behind me, and there was. There was no rush, so I just uh, brought the car home. And I mean, it didn't feel because it didn't feel like again, it didn't feel like a super race. It didn't feel like I deserved necessarily the victory. It didn't feel anything special when I crossed the line. But uh, I remember there's one particular great moment uh, in all of my career when Ron came on on the radio and said, that, "Welcome to the winner's circle." That was a nice moment, and uh, I wasn't expecting that. Usually, uh, my engineer is coming to my radio and congratulating, but then. At that point, Ron was coming on the radio, and that was a nice feeling. That's probably the the best memory from that weekend and from from all of my McLaren time. The particular radio call. Uh, welcome to the world of winning. 
Ike. Uh, first of many. Well deserved win. To finish first, you first got to finish. Well done. It's a funny sport, isn't it? How you win a race that you feel that perhaps you didn't deserve to. Are there races where you felt you drove brilliantly and didn't win, conversely? Yeah, I think there are more races uh, like that. Um, and uh, actually, uh, after my McLaren, Renault and McLaren years, uh, the years with uh, Caterham, Lotus first and then Caterham, I think uh, some of those races I felt I did a better job and I, I did a race with uh, less mistakes and and uh, good in laps, good out laps, uh, good race starts, and all that, and finishing seventeenth. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was kind of um, hard to take. But uh, I, I feel those years I did better races. I, I was better race driver at that time. I think the years of McLaren and, and Renault and the struggles there have taught me a lot of things. And then when I went to Caterham, I think I was able to handle the situation better. And I, I'm pretty sure had I been in a better car and had the car been faster at that time, I would have been able to do better results compared to what I did my with my time, for example, at McLaren. So uh, I was, I think I just arrived at McLaren a, a bit early, a bit uh, green, a bit too rookie um, in many aspects. And uh, I became a better race driver during those years. Just that the, the team and the car didn't develop enough to kind of get another wave of momentum going. Um, that was the idea after the McLaren years, you know, to go to a smaller team, go back to basics and, and uh, trying to get myself better frame of mind and, and uh, get more performance out of myself. And I think I did that uh, initially. But um, yeah, then progress of the team then kind of stalled and and it kind of took me with... The ship was sinking and I kind of went with with uh, with that. When you joined Lotus, did you believe it could become a serious challenger? Um, initially, no. I, I thought that the first year will be tough and kind of knew that uh, starting from scratch is going to be hard. But I didn't think we were going to be five seconds off the pace <laughs> like we were initially. I, I thought we were going to be a couple of seconds off the pace. And I thought we are going to be at the back of the queue, but we'll be in the queue but in fact, we were not even able to join the established teams uh, queue, if you like. Only the new teams at the back were racing their own championship. And after the first year, I thought that they were going to make more progress. And then the second year, progress didn't really happen. We got a bit closer, but still not seriously challenging anyone yet. And uh, at that point, it was kind of getting to... I was starting to think like, well, shit, you know, is this, is this going to work out or not? And uh, then the third year uh, already... Um, Felt like it started to go downhill. Uh, the investments were were not there. The team needed more push on, on every area, and in fact, uh, there was just uh, uh, the development was kind of stalling as well. So it started to look a bit worrying. I mean, you say the investment wasn't there. How, how committed was owner Tony Fernandez? I think at the end, uh, uh, I mean, initially, I think he was relatively committed, and I think he, I think he thought that it'd be uh, easier to to join the queue and and get further up the grid than the first year when things didn't happen. I think that that was kind of expected. And, and But the second year, I think he was expecting more. And uh, I think when he realized that you know, spending 100 million plus a year and nothing happening, you know, it kind of, the excitement kind of started to die down a little bit. And uh, I think uh, at that point, they probably realized that uh, this might not work out. And then they were starting to scale things back. And, and at that point, and it was, of course, the wrong decision if you wanted to to move the team off the grid. So, yeah, I think initially I think they were committed, but uh, quite quickly I think they became unsure of of that thing. Did you have anything else on the table for 2010? I mean, in hindsight, was it the wrong call, the wrong decision to go there? Uh, 2010, uh, no, not really. It was quite a complicated situation. I just actually um, gotten into a bit of a management battle with Flavio. Um, Flavio got the um, penalty or the, the ban from FIA, if you like, for what happened in Singapore. And at some point, it was in fact at the end of like October 2009, towards the end of 2009 season, when when I was told actually by the FIA uh, that I won't be granted a super license if I'm managed by Flavio or his management company. And then um, at that point, I had an offer from Mike Gascoigne and from Tony. And at that point, it was looking like McLaren was not going to keep me. It was quite obvious. So, and they wanted to sign the the Lotus deal as soon as possible. But at that point, I kind of like 
I, I got a message from the FIA that you know I can't sign that with Flavio, and then um, you know s- stopped the management contract with Flavio and, and took things into my own hands and and signed with Lotus. And at that point, I thought it was it was not the, sort of the best move that I could have done. Had I had a slightly better team uh, on table, a more established team, uh, I probably would have gone that way. But I thought starting from from the back of the grid with a new team with some prospects would be the the right thing to do. And initially I thought when things were starting to move on that, that this, these people are serious and, and this team has got some prospects and it was a good choice. But in the end, uh, it, it was a wrong choice. And in fact, after after the two thousand or during the two, 2010 season, um, I met uh, with Eric Bullier uh, from Renault and Renault were interested uh, about the next season, 2011 season. And I, I met Bullier in Valencia during the Grand Prix weekend, and he said that we'd be interested. But I had a two-year deal with Lotus, and uh, I didn't want to get into a other trouble with uh, with any contract at, at that point. So I said to Bullier that I I can't do it, although I'd be interested, but I can't do it. And and I think at that point I should have I should have gone with Renault and uh, got into a better car. I think I would have been in a in a better place myself, and I would have been able to perform better. But uh, I didn't want to get into another legal battle and uh, I didn't do that. And that was probably a mistake. Do you think if you'd had a bespoke manager behind you at that moment, you would have got yourself in the Renault for 2011 because they would have taken care of the politics and the legal side of it? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, at that point, uh, we were doing everything with myself and my wife. um, And I was battling with Flavio couple of years in fact in the court and and i think actually one of the biggest mistakes for my career was to um leave flavio's management company i think they did the best contracts for me in formula one and and they in fact uh, looked after me since the Renault junior years i signed with flavio in 2002 and uh, when i signed my first test driver contract uh, flavio was able to jump a couple of steps on the on the payment schedule and he got me more money uh, of course, he took a slice of it, but he got me more money than I deserved uh, as a test driver. And my race driver contracts, they were all always better than the initial Flavio contract said. And um, I should have just, I mean, like other drivers like uh, Fernando and uh, Mark, of course, they had contracts in place for 2010. So for them, perhaps the decision to stick with Flavio was easier. But um, uh, in hindsight, I should have stuck to Flavio and I think he would have been able to get me a, a great contract and he would have been able to negotiate me a better better throughout the years and um, and that's one big regret that I, I, I stopped the contract. Heike, I'm siding with you because if the FIA have told you you won't get a super license if you're with Flavio Briatori, that leaves you in a particularly difficult place, doesn't it? It was, yeah. And I remember it was also part of the, it's not the reason, but perhaps part of the reason. It certainly didn't help the second half of 2009 season with McLaren. This thing was going on in the background. And uh, I remember we had a morning briefing at Suzuka uh, Saturday. We were preparing for the third practice and for qualifying. And after the morning briefing, I walked into the FI office and I met with Alan Donnelly in the office in the middle of a race weekend. And I asked him the question, Alan, what do I need to do? If I stick with Flavio, you know, can I sign with with Lotus? And he said very clearly to me, no, you won't be granted a super license. And it's as simple as that. And um, you know, at that point it was it was a tough place for me to to be. And then in the end I decided to take things to my own hands and and uh, stop the contract with Flavio. And um yeah, yeah, I can I you know, I never had any problems with Flavio. I never I you know, I always liked him as my manager. And uh, the people that were running his company day to day, Bruno Michel, Matthew Michel, they did great deals for me. They looked after me very well. They weren't very welcome at McLaren. They they weren't very friendly with uh, the Flavio. It's kind of the Flavio gang wasn't that friendly with Ron gang. But I think uh, you know that that wasn't uh, the game changer. That wasn't wasn't the reason. I think they they looked after me very well, and then they kept my side of the things always. Uh, very well and um, then actually uh, once I stopped the contract with Flavio the next couple of years uh, when we were doing things with my wife uh, just me and my wife you know we actually thought that yeah we need someone else we we need someone here to help us to move things forward and at that point um, 
we were considering, we, in fact, I met uh, uh, Mika Häkkinen and Didier Kotson. I met them at Singapore during the Singapore Grand Prix. I think it was 2000 and whatever it was. Uh, was it 2011, perhaps? And I, I was uh, kind of uh, sniffing around that, uh, you know, once this Flavio case is finished, you know, I didn't want to have another manager while I was still having this fight with Flavio. But once that is settled one way or the other for the future, would they be interested to look after me? And in fact, uh, they were. And, and Mika was uh, was very interested too, and he thought he could bring something to the table and he could be of help. But then, for whatever reason, um, it, it didn't happen. It kind of like the, that chat kind of stalled. And eventually, actually, I took uh, an American management company, IMG, and they were managing me for one year the 2012 season and that was perhaps another mistake and uh, in fact I think uh, my relationship with Mika has uh, you know during those those times uh, I, I feel that uh, Mika perhaps uh, felt a bit uh, let down if you like like I probably didn't communicate with him very well and kind of like uh, then when I took the IMG I think Mika was a bit surprised and our relationship has never been the same since then I feel um, which is a shame you know I respect Mika a lot and it's a shame that on this management side there's been quite a lot of uh, things that have gone wrong almost accidentally you know it's not been a purpose uh, I've always tried to do the right thing but I've been in a quite a difficult place many times and I've tried to do the right thing and perhaps I've done the wrong thing at the first place with Flavio and had I not done that then the rest of the story would have been more straightforward but um, it's fascinating yeah yeah I think I needed um, those two years at McLaren opened a lot of eyes for, for myself in terms of my own performance and what I need to improve and what I need to focus on the race weekends. And I think when I went to Lotus the first year, 2010, I think I was a better race driver. And, and after the first year at Lotus, I think I think I was handling the Grand Prix weekend very well. And at that point, I needed the management to be there sorting the rest of the things out. And, and that wasn't there. And I think that was one big puzzle that was missing from that kind of comeback a plan that I had, if you like. Yeah, because you were wasting energy, I suppose, on contracts and things when you needed to be focusing on the driving. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say like how much that affected, and I I don't, you know, I don't want to make an excuse. Um, I think during the McLaren years, even if I'd had the best managers on my background, and I think you know the McLaren team, many times people say that the McLaren they were favoring Lewis and he was number one, but I mean he was just tiny bit quicker I think it's as simple as that he just had the edge and I just had to stretch and I just quite couldn't hang on to him enough to to be a serious threat and and to be grounded another year there I think it's as simple as that but um, if I then after after that phase of my career if the things uh, on the background had been in place I think the, the sort of the second half of my career Formula One career if you like that could be and could have been quite different and I felt that you know, when eventually when I had to stop from Formula One, I was quite disappointed because I felt at that point the performances were much stronger. And I felt, shit, you know, I, I think I'm in control of this situation now, but things are just stalling <laughs> around me. It, yeah. was, it, was, it was frustrating. It's not fair to say how did McLaren and Lotus compare, because I'm just guessing it was such a big gulf. But perhaps a better question is to say, how did McLaren and Renault compare as teams and environments to go racing? Um, th- there were less differences than people think. I mean, many people uh, always thought about McLaren that it's quite a strict environment and quite um, uh, sort of Ron-like, if you like. <laughs> Ron is a particular person and I mean, he's, he was a particular kind of leader and and all that, but they both are very much racing-driven teams. Uh, Ron was always saying that you know any other business that their company are doing are irrelevant if the racing side doesn't work. And Renault was always the same that you know they they were willing to take risks and extreme design concepts and push things beyond the limits to achieve some edge over the others. And they were both uh, great race teams. They were very uh, they had some strong-minded people, some very clever people. The McLaren facility uh, walking was better. It was state of art uh, and the end stone was a bit more old style, but uh, they had a lot of similarities. In fact, they were less different than many people think. And um, Pat Simmons running the technical side of Renault, uh, he was very, very much of a 
racing kind of guy, very switched on, uh, very not not conservative, very very aggressive in in many ways. Uh, Flavio was aggressive in different kind of way, but the positive way. He was the the figurehead, the leader. But uh, both teams had strong leaders in Flavio and in Ron, and the technical team were both aggressive and and. I think for a driver, they were both great teams to be involved. In fact, only when I went to Lotus and started a, a new team, smaller facility, I, I realized that shit, you know, things that I complained at McLaren and Renault <laughs> weren't actually that bad. It was interesting. When you started racing for Renault in 2007, you were replacing Fernando Alonso, who'd gone to McLaren. And Flavio said something I thought really interesting at the start of that year in that he said, in Kovalainen, I hope to find the anti Alonso. <laughs> yeah. And I still to this day don't really know what he meant by that. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, up to that point. I mean, the fact that he's using you and Alonso in the same sentence makes me think he was putting a little bit of pressure on you. Did you feel that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I felt pressure. And um, of course, jumping into the two time world champions car as, as a rookie year. Uh, he just uh, won the championship, you know. It, it was um, I, I even at that point I probably didn't really appreciate the challenge, you know. I kind of thought that you know I'm ready, you know. I'm a young driver. I've passed all these young, you know, the junior categories, and you know I'm the next big thing. And I, you know, Melbourne was quite a quite a tough landing for me when I went there, and you know, just completely out of control a weekend, and wasn't able to focus on the right things, and and uh, it was. Uh, it was a wake-up call, but uh, at that point, uh, in fact, uh, the guy that was guiding me the best was Pat Simons there. Uh, Flavio was, of course, uh, telling me to push and telling the engineers, telling him to push, and you know, <laughs> but that wasn't kind of the right guidance that I needed at that, po- that point. And he was just giving a little bit of pressure. The Pat Simons was the guy that was guiding me the best, and my engineering team were guiding me very well. Eventually, I found my feet. Uh, but uh, I think uh, I'm sure Flavio saw a lot of potential in me all the way through the junior years i've been ticking the boxes every year winning races and winning championships up to the point when i became a test driver and he'd invested in my career and his management company invested in my career so of course they had high hopes i'm sure and uh, they saw a lot of potential maybe the reason he was talking about anti alonso maybe he thought that uh, i could be i could be up there you know fighting and, and stopping fernando winning or, or trying to fight for him uh, fight with him at the at the top um I'm sure that's how they felt uh, up to that point. You're actually in a unique position in that whilst Renault test driver in 2006, and I think you did nearly 30,000 kilometers of testing that year or something. It was huge, wasn't it? But you worked in the world champion team alongside Fernando Alonso. And then, of course, the next year you're with Lewis Hamilton. So I'd love you just to give me your thoughts on Fernando as a racing driver, as a person, Relative to Lewis, really? Yeah, they were um, obviously both uh, extremely fast drivers. You know, I remember always those days uh, we had a separate test teams and I was usually driving for three days the other car and then Fernando and Fizzi were altering the, the other car. And in fact, quite often I had uh, some really good programs. I had uh, 22 sets of new tires for the day and Fernando was doing some front wing comparison or some uh, engine reliability testing or something so my times quite often looked quite good and i probably didn't appreciate i probably didn't look the data carefully enough to really see the truth because many times i felt my lap times were really competitive compared to fernando or compared to fizzy but uh, i'd kind of forgotten the fact that he had four sets of tires and i had 22 sets of soft tires you're not exaggerating did you really have 22 sets of tires yeah yeah i i I think uh, probably not exaggerating much at least amazing i honestly i've done some big tire testing days and uh uh, the short runs were always the interesting ones you know and they're all pretty good tires they're not all all perfect tires but sometimes really good and you know a bit of extra revs from the engine for the performance runs and things always looked quite good um but uh in terms of uh, personalities and in terms of like race drivers they both obviously extremely fast and and they're both very good at uh, working with the engineering team and in fact the whole team in fact the, the people at the factory and they like uh, both very active uh, in giving feedback to the factory and perhaps something that I overlooked also during my career. Sometimes I wasn't that bothered about if some button wasn't 
in the right place or <laughs> if it wasn't in a perfect place in the steering wheel. And for example, in some some cases, I remember I, we arrived at the test and the brake balance adjuster at that, those days was still a kind of manual adjuster. It been shifted to the other side of the cockpit, and I was surprised at what's happened here. The so Star Louis wanted it to to be changed to the other side, so we wanted to change both cars, so we have the same spares and stuff, and that kind of things happened. Where you know, I I never thought about that kind of things. I've, I, in fact, it was not maybe not a bad change. It was a good change, but I never thought about it. I thought it's been designed to put there, and it's kind of there, and I can I can manage with it, and. But they were both that kind of guys that got into these kind of small details. Some small buttons got changed and they actually then made sense most of the time. They're both really good at that. I think uh, the attention to detail, the ability to work with uh, not just the race engineer or the engineering team at the track, but also the ability to work with the designers at the factory have given them edge over the years. They've gotten exactly the kind of areas that are lacking in the car for them they've gotten them uh, working that way who was better under pressure because you saw both of them you know in the midst of a world championship fight you know you saw fernando okay he clinched it in brazil it wasn't the last race of the year in 2006 but and then of course you saw brazil in 2008 with lewis who was sort of dealing with that pressure the best it's, it's very hard to um, say they both were dealing it very well I'd say that Fernando all the way through his um, career and I mean certainly the time that I was with him he was perhaps more ruthless you know he he was he would always take things to the edge and um, he would perhaps play more sort of silly mind games compared to Lewis when Lewis was younger he was also doing that a little bit He's certainly over the years, Lewis have gotten, perhaps he's more confident in his just the sheer speed nowadays. And, and he can he can finish second one day if, you know, takes too much of a risk to, to try to win the race. But uh, I'd say that Fernando has always been, and, and when I was with him uh, as a test driver, he was always very aggressive, very ruthless. And he was uh, very direct with his feedback with the, with the team and kind of more like a Latino type of personality Lewis was always more polite even when he wasn't happy with things uh, when he needed some changes he was still able to do it more politely <laughs> Fernando was more direct kind of and uh, perhaps it's, it's coming from the background you know Lewis have been with McLaren and with Ron for years and and you could kind of see a bit of the, the Ron uh, kind of behavior in in Lewis, and you could see kind of a bit of Flavio behavior in in Fernando. But it's I I think it's very hard to compare which one was better under pressure. I think they both were really good, really excellent. I I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say which was better. I think it's not probably fair to compare. Can you see why it didn't work with them in the same team? Yeah, I can absolutely see why it didn't work with them. I mean, they were first of all they were so close on performance that they were always near each other on the circuit and then uh, I think this uh, kind of Flavio style and, and Ron style was clashing in, in all aspects of race weekend and, and any particular race it was kind of clashing quite easily uh, they both had and, and I mean, they both have a kind of killer instinct it's uh, the fight for for win and then the need to beat each other was too great. So it was quite easy to see that that situation could escalate, and it did. Coming back to you, there are various pivotal moments, aren't there, in a racing driver's career? And weirdly, given the success you had in, in circuit racing in the junior formulas, do you think one of the things that sealed the deal with Renault for you was winning the race of champions in 2004, beating Michael Schumacher? Did that, I remember that, result there was a lot of buzz about you after that did that help in any way i'm sure it did um at that point i was very unknown junior driver in some junior program with with renault doing something um and uh, in fact i got chosen to be part of that race because the usual guns in finland kimi or mika or both mikas in fact salo or hakinen or no one else was available or was not interested to do. So I was eventually the the one in the line who said, yeah, I'd happily do it. And um, it was funny weekend. Uh, already 
during the um, practice day, one of the marshals came to me after the day. There was like a lot of, I don't know if they're paid or volunteers, but one of the French guy came to me who was timing things. And he, he came to me and said, by the way, you have, you've been the fastest in every car that you've been testing. <laughs> we did like a practice run on each different type of cars that they had. He came to me and said, by the way, you're, you're quickest in all, all of the cars, every car. And I was like, okay. Did that surprise you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, at first time that I met many of these guys, you know, I was in the same changing room with with Michael, with Sebastian Loeb, with Jean Lacy, with David Coulter. All the, they didn't had no idea who I was. Obviously, I knew all of them. And I was just almost not, I wasn't asking autographs, but almost like kind of, you know, hanging with the big boys. And uh, then I think I went and I beat... Alesi, I beat Coulthard. I think then I beat Michael in a Ferrari. That was quite funny. I yeah. mean, so unexpected. It's a great moment when I won that race. I couldn't believe it. And it's probably what the rock stars feel every time they have a big concert, you know, step out of the out of the car on the roof and the whole start de France cheering. They're looking, who is this kid? And um, yeah, then I went to super final with Sebastian Loeb and I, I beat him in a rally car. I mean, that was that was funny and uh now nah, you're finished though yeah all yeah. Finns can do that yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's i've always felt that i've been able to adapt to different kind of cars i mean i've done a bit of rallying in my career and i've always felt it hasn't been like so difficult to change to cars i've always felt like any kind of car or bike or whatever i like i get hang of it relatively well pretty quickly and i'm sure that helped i remember um flavio he called me after the event uh, pat simons also uh talked to me after the event and they all congratulated me and the whole Renault team they were so happy about it i, I didn't think it was going to be such a big thing but i think like you said uh, it had a very positive and reasonably big impact in my career um and one one another funny story after the race we went to back to Paris to the center. We stayed in the um, George Sang Hotel, very fancy hotel in the middle of Paris. And uh, we got into a lift and uh, Jean Todd, he was the boss of Ferrari at that time. He got to the same lift and uh, he kind of looked at me a little bit uh, first. And then he asked me, the, what was your name again? <laughs> uh, I said, oh, my name is Heike Kovalainen, by the way. Uh, nice to meet you. And it's probably first time um, I got some attention some real attention from some big uh, names in motorsport and uh, i'm sure it did a lot of good for my career although it was not an important event I w- it wasn't an event that i was even planning to do until i got invited but it had a positive impact i'm sure it did and i'm sure schumacher mentioned you to jean todd hence the moment in the live yeah look at the reaction you got from pat look at the reaction you got from Flavio, you know, that could have been the launch pad, couldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it probably was. You know, at that time, there were still quite a few drivers in the Renault Junior program. And I don't think I was standing out that much from the guys that were still there. There was, uh, I can't remember exactly who were there, but there were some good drivers still in the program. And perhaps that was one of the things that really caught the attention of Flavio. I think Flavio was really key to my career at that point, And maybe that was a kind of pivotal moment. And he thought, damn you know this guy maybe maybe this is the one that we need to keep an eye on out of all the young drivers that they have yeah yeah absolutely well look Heike when you look back what was it it was 111 races wasn't it in Formula 1 what was your best race I've got this feeling you're not going to say Hungary 2008 yeah I mean of course that's the only win you know it's it's kind of like yeah I won a Grand Prix and yeah it's it's great but like I said I, di- I didn't think in terms of performance it was outstanding i thought towards the end of 2008 i had some really good races for example the race at fuji i had a gearbox failure there but i think i could have won that race um i think there was alonso and kubica in front of me Luis and massa they had accident on the first lap and i mean i think I, I i would have been riding that fight there and then like i said uh, some of the races that i did with Caterham, i think suzuka 2011 or 12 um uh, and then also Abu Dhabi in 2000 and again, 11 or 12, I can't remember whichever race, but uh, Timo Glock was behind me in uh, Virgin or Marussia, whatever it was called at that point. Uh, I remember that particular race, um, I was able to extend the gap 10th by 10th, you know, every lap and no mistakes. And we had good pit stops, good in laps, good out laps. I think it's the best race is coming from that part of my career. I don't think it was the victory in Hungary or some other races before that. I, I think it's one of those... <laughs> races where I finished 17th I think they're one of the the good ones and uh, had I had a better car I believe I could have been fighting right near the front 
What is it about fins and sim racing? I just want to ask you this question before you go, because we're all on shutdown at the minute. We're wondering when Formula One is going to start again. And a lot of drivers are getting doing this sim racing now. Not Kimi Raikkonen, not Valtteri Bottas. As far as I can make out, not Heike Kovalainen. What is it about the fins? You just like getting out there and doing it for real, don't you? Yeah, uh, it's it's a good question. Um, I think Kimi uh, has never been a massive fan of uh, any simulators, even in his Formula One teams. He's never been that keen to actually get on the sims and out. maybe only when the team have really ordered him <laughs> to do a few laps, he's turned up. <laughs> Perhaps... Uh, I mean, at least, at least my feeling, and I mean, I haven't done sim racing. I think I'm going to do a little bit this summer. Um, oh my God. Shock horror. Wait, hold the front page. What's yeah. happening? Are you getting get, You're getting a sim. Yeah, I've got a sim, in fact, coming, a uh, quite a good one um, with the proper, uh, it's got some motion platform and, and some big screens and all that. It's coming and I'm going to try a little bit. I'm going to do some stuff. I mean, I'm getting old, so I need, I'm going to get rusty too quickly, I think. So I need to do something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried. Is the internet good enough in Northern Finland? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got a yeah, great sim coming and my uh, internet connection might be letting me down. But uh, I mean, then I need a digger and a, and a fiber optic the size of my uh, my forearm to, <laughs> to be dug on the ground. Then uh, I think uh, eventually we'll solve that as well. But, you know, at least my experience uh, from the simulators so far in my career has been that they're good tools, but they've not been able to replicate and they've not been able to simulate the real deal, if you like, well enough. I don't think the sims have been as good as, for example, in the airplane industry. I think they are, they are very useful and they, you can get kind of very similar feel that you're flying the real plane. And it's very difficult to get that kind of feel in the in the race car. And, and I think Kimi, certainly, I don't know, Valtteri, but Kimi, at least, I'm guessing that the reason he's not that keen on them is if he feels that they are not so relevant. They or they might be relevant, but they're not so realistic and like not good enough tools yet. Um, and my feeling has been a bit similar throughout my career. I did a lot of sim work at McLaren and I did a lot of sim work also at Caterham eventually when they got the sim. But it was hard to hard to take some real differences in the sim that I felt it was hard to take them to the race circuit or or get the same feel at the race circuit. So it was more useful for circuit familiarization and that kind of stuff. But to get some real work done in the sim is very difficult in the in the racing world, I think. I haven't you know, I haven't driven a, the latest F1 sim. I don't know how good they are now. And I'm getting a good one here. It's not an F1 sim that I'm getting, but I'm getting a reasonably good one here. So I'll soon I'll figure out if they are anywhere near i hope we're gonna see you racing racing charles leclerc he's winning everything at the moment. <laughs> yeah i don't know uh, i need to practice a little bit and see what kind of lap times are, are happening if they're anywhere near then i could think about it. if they're too slow then i won't turn up so I, if i turn up i want to be at least reasonably competitive i don't want to do a johnny herbert and uh, cut the first corner and go from 16 to first and then be disqualified <laughs> you know, always I, competitive fakey aren't you always competitive Qu quickly how how's life treating you in japan are you are you enjoying the super gt out there are you enjoying living out where are you in tokyo yeah I, when i'm in japan i'm uh, staying in tokyo i stay actually quite a lot of the year there obviously this year is a bit unknown we will see when the season starts at the moment we have a provisional calendar starting in uh, july but uh We'll obviously monitor the situation. I'm a bit skeptical about that, whether it will start in July or the season. But uh, I think I've settled in very well. In fact, um, I'm quite uh, happy that I've been able to move on from my Formula One days. Uh, like I said, you know, I wasn't planning to stop in Formula One when it did stop. And uh, it was it was tough to take first, but then uh, I'm glad I've been able to move on. I found a good family there with Toyota. They start racing. Um, I've been working with them now over the years. Um, we won race apart from the first year. We won a race at least every year, and we won the championship in '16. And I've enjoyed racing there. The cars are actually quite a nice GT cars. They've got uh, quite a good grip for a GT car. The power could be more, but uh, the chassis are very nice. Um, circuits are nice. The Japanese fans are maybe one of the best in the world. Uh, there's a lot of followers coming to see the races and, and uh, working with Toyota has been straightforward. Um, I've enjoyed being there and it's kind of like third part of my professional career. First, there was the Renault and McLaren, was, if you like, the first phase and then the Caterham Lotus, bit of a chaos and then now more 
settled with the Toyota. And uh, yeah, I've enjoyed there. And I'm still very motivated to race. Um, I'll keep racing until I feel motivated, until I feel it's the right thing to do. And it's something that also keeps me motivated, uh, keeping my fitness and my training regime going. And uh, so far, so good. I think it's not a bad place for me to be. But uh, I go year by year. And then um, at some point, perhaps uh, it's time to do something different. But at, at the moment, at least I'm enjoying it and I'll keep doing it until that enjoyment uh, stays, I think. Do you enjoy life in Japan, the pace of life? It's very different, isn't it, to the European way? Yeah, it's very different. And uh, it's, in fact, a very big contrast uh, staying here in Lapland in the middle of forest. I've got only one neighbor. Um, in fact, a, a Finnish guy who is running a Moto2 and Moto3 team, Aki Ayo, He's my neighbor here, and uh, he's also uh, he's the only one that is around here. <laughs> so we've been able to hang out a little bit, although keeping a bit of distance, no, no handshaking or anything with him. But uh, it's very quiet here, and then in contrast, the center of Tokyo is like the busiest place in the world almost. And every now and then I need the break from Tokyo, but uh, in principle, I've enjoyed life there. Tokyo is very international city it's not as japanese as perhaps uh, outside of tokyo where it's difficult to manage without the uh, language skills and and uh, sort of the japanese uh, way of life but tokyo is very international and there are a few foreign guys uh, out there as well a few race drivers that we can hang out and do things together so i enjoy life there and uh, the moment and the day that i don't enjoy then i gotta stop going there and go somewhere else well hey Keith, good luck with everything that comes in the Super GTs. And thank you for a most wonderful chat, reflecting on all things Formula One. I've loved it. It's been really interesting and I've learned loads. Yeah, thanks very much for having me in your show. It's uh, You've done some, some great podcasts. I've listened to most of them and uh, you've had some some interesting guys to chat. And uh, yeah, I hope to uh, given you a, a small insight of what's sort of been going on and uh, glad uh, if you've enjoyed it and if uh, the listeners have enjoyed it as well. Great stuff. Thank you, Heike. Good to speak. Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks, Heike. What a fascinating chat. No excuses, just honesty and reflection. I think a lot of young drivers could learn from Heike's experiences because careers can turn on a dime in this sport. And it's so important to remain ahead of the curve in everything that you do, both on and off the racetrack. It's hard to pick a favourite bit of what Heike had to say. There was a little bit of gold dust all the way through. His memory of events is astounding. And in particular, I love the recollections of his time at McLaren, of being alongside Lewis Hamilton in the same team. And that bet with Lewis about who'd be flat out through Eau Rouge on lap one of practice at the Belgian Grand Prix was amazing. Stories like that is what this podcast is all about. Thanks, Heike, for your time. It was great to catch up and good luck with your racing in Japan whenever the race season over there gets going again. Right, it's time to dig into the virtual mailbag and see what you guys have been saying about the show. First, here's a note about last week's episode with Racing Point's technical director, Andrew Green. I've been a fan of Racing Point ever since Mr. Malia bought the team, says Soen Blomick. This podcast helped me understand the mentality of this team and that has made me fall in love with the team even more. Thanks for bringing us this podcast. Well, what a lovely note, Soam. Thank you. And I have to agree that Andrew was a sensational guest. Looking through the mailbag, it's also fun to find out how you guys listen to Beyond the Grid. Pierre Mayo in Montreal got in touch to say this. I always wait to have five or six episodes in the queue before listening to Beyond the Grid but each time I wish I had more to listen to. And in two weeks, I would have attended my 43rd Grand Prix, 40 of them in Montreal, one in Watkins Glen in 1979, and one in Magny Corps in 1993. Now, I know there's a chance you're not gonna hear this message for five weeks, Pierre, but thank you. And what a tally of races you've watched over the years. You're a true F1 fan. Well, that's it for another episode, but of course, we'll be back next week with another big name from Formula One. In the meantime, if you want to drop me a message about the show and potentially get a shout out on here, I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter, or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Please keep your messages coming. We read them all and love hearing what you have to say. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening. And as ever, Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, Keep it flat out.